Good morning, everyone. Wow, I'm a bit loud. I'm already loud. <laughs> so I don't need to be loud on the mic, you know. Anyways, uh, it's so good to be here. Uh, as I came here I, and I heard the worship, I thought of Tony Campolo. How many know Tony Campolo? Yeah, Tony Campolo is a, is a great man of God. Uh, he's in Eastern University uh, in the Uni United States. He's a great evangelist on fire. He was one of the advisors to, to Bill Clinton. Now, uh, we were doing a conference together, and I was kind of shocked why they choose me to, to, to be with him, you know, at the same stage kind of thing, you know? I thought, surely they have picked me to make him look better, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but then they introduced him. Uh, he, was, uh, he was just sharing about his story. He said, on an Easter Sunday, they asked me to preach in the church. And he's in a church of uh, all, uh, the, most of the church members are black. So he's like really a live church kind of thing. He said, you know, the pastor told me, I, I want to give you the, the honor of speaking on, on the Resurrection Sunday. And he said, that's a big deal in a black church. That's a big deal. You don't just give the, the Resurrection Sunday to anybody. So he said, I prepared for months to get a nice sermon together. And he's a uh, professor in, in the theology, and he has written over 35 books and everything. And he said, I put all of my heart into this sermon. But he said, halfway through the sermon, I knew I'm not doing well. He said, some of you may think, how does he know that he's not doing well? He said, well, in a black church, you know you're not doing well. Because the black the lady, the old lady in the back got up and he, she just raised her hands and said, Lord, help him. He, he ain't doing well. He ain't doing well. Lord, help him. You know? He said, that was my cue that I'm not doing well. <laughs> I said, I'm glad, you know, <laughs> to be in a church that if I'm not doing well, someone will get up and pray for me, you know. <laughs> so, it's good to be with you guys. I wanted to, to share a bit of my own story, but also I want to tell you that how sometimes you meet the Lord in a powerful way, but still not get all that he has for you. So I, I want to, to just say to us, it's okay if we haven't gotten all that God has told us about himself. It's okay if we haven't become so perfect and, you know, and we are not victorious in all the areas. It's okay, because God's main idea of him coming into our life was not that he would take us in one instant from, from uh, being a loser and making us a great victorious person in all the moments of our life, but rather he wanted to come and meet us in the deep, dark point of our life and journey with us all the way back to the kingdom and he wanted us to enjoy that journey and so for that I need to take you back with me to my own journey and tell you how I missed that journey how I missed the joy of that journey why am I telling you that because I don't want you to make the same mistake that I made. <laughs> I tell people, I have absolutely no issue with you guys making mistakes. I just pray that you don't make the same mistakes that I have made. And I assure you, if you don't make the same mistakes that I have made, oh my goodness, man, you will have to work really hard to find a mistake to make it. Because I've, I think I've made all of them, you know. <laughs> I say often to the angels, take a message to Paul and say to him, it's, you're lucky you, you, you were born 2,000 years earlier. Otherwise, I would have taken that, that title of chief of sinners from you, beat you right, right away on that, you know. You killed one, I have killed six, you have done this, I have done everything I've done, I've done more. 
So, yes, I was born in Iran, uh, same country as Pastor Ali. I'm born in the south in a city called Abaddon, which most probably is the city that Adam ended up in after he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And that's no joke, that's true. <laughs> so, uh, when people say, you know, uh, where are the people from? I said, they're from my city, you know. <laughs> Humbly, of course, you know. <laughs> so, anyways, I came out of, uh, the, I, came, I was born in the time of the revolution in Iran. There was a huge, huge uh, atmosphere of, of Islam that was bubbling in the spirit of people. They wanted to live uh, a life that is dedicated to Allah. And my father and grandfather were such people. And so I grew up being, uh, being really, uh, in many ways, inspired by these guys to live such a life. And so as a child, as I was growing up, I always had things that I couldn't explain, but it was always told to me. Like every time I had an accident, and most of them were my mom's fault, you know, believe it or not, uh, every time I had an accident, I would see uh, the silhouette of a tall man that watches over me. And I would say to people, there is a tall man that always watches over me. And they told me it's one of the imams of the Shia Islam, the Imam Ali. I said, but they said that he was short, but this guy is tall. So they said, Oh, it's because you see him in the spirit realm, and he was such a giant spiritually, that's why he looks taller. And I thought to myself, man, if so, my brother, my older brother Bobby, should become a very spiritual man because he's a bit short, you know. <laughs> Maybe he'll have a chance in the next round to be taller, you know. I bug him all the time, I know he, he likes it, you know. If he doesn't, still I do the brotherly thing, you know. So, anyways, so I felt indebted to Islam. I wanted to live a life that, that pleased Allah. And so, uh, at age 12 or so, I started uh, doing all my, my things, uh, all uh, the rules and regulations that I had to do in order to be a true Muslim. But above and beyond that, I thought, that's not enough. God has done so much more for me, I need to do more. And so I thought, okay, I'll join the Basij, which you guys know in the West as Hezbollah. So I was part of the militia group. And so in that, I joined, uh, as I uh, went further in it, I thought, that's not enough. I want to volunteer to go walk on mines and die for God. That would be surely enough. Well, I was underage and I kind of, told the people a uh, white lie and told them my parents are dead so you can't have their permission because they're dead. And uh, I got on the bus to go to the front line and my father came back to life and came and found the bus and stopped the bus, you know, <laughs> which was a bit embarrassing, you know. But simultaneously they asked me, why did you lie to us? I said, I really wanted and I truly wanted to, to die for my faith. I really loved God, but that was the God I knew. So anyways, uh, they said, okay, since you have that much passion, they put me in a part of the army that we were able to kill for Allah. If I'm not willing to, uh, if I wasn't allowed to die for Allah, they put me part of the execution guards, so we went and hung people. So that's why I say that uh, I have been in six execution, and so, uh, but that wasn't feeling enough. My grandfather told me, go to United States and convert Christians into Islam. I thought, that would be a great idea now. You know, and uh, surely, you know, this, this would please Allah. So with that idea, I came out of Iran in 87, 1987, went to uh, Pakistan. There, I studied uh, about Sunnah, the Sunni Islam. And then uh, I was involved also with the Shia movement in Karachi. 1989, I traveled with illegal passports to Malaysia, where I was arrested and put in jail. 
while I was in jail, they recognized that I have an extensive knowledge of Islam. I have studied Islam for many, many years. That was what I did, what I love to do. But out of Islam and studying Islam, I had gained the spiritual powers. I worked with the ajanne, which uh, you get the word genie from. So the powers that I had gained uh, allowed me to do certain things. And people knew that if someone did injustice to somebody else and they wanted them to get hurt, they would come to me and ask me, would you set prayer for such and such a person? And I'll pray for them and they get hurt. You know? And so I did these kind of things, but I wanted more power. And one night as I was praying and meditating, there was a, a spirit that appeared and instantly I knew that this spirit is a dark spirit, it's a dangerous spirit, and it intends for my life. So I uh, desperately started to fight this spirit in the name of Allah um, and through the scriptures of Quran. But none of it worked. At some point, I was so desperate and I was having a hard time breathing. I said, God help me. And the moment I said, God help me, I heard a voice like, as clear as you hear my voice that said, bring the name of Jesus. Now, I didn't think about it. I just was like a man that was drowning. And instantly, I opened my mouth. And without me thinking, I formed this sentence that came out of my mouth. G Jesus, if you are the truth, show me yourself. Now, I don't know why I said that. But before the sentence was finished, the spirit was gone. And that confused me. Because we say in Islam, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. And how come the name of Jesus accomplishes something that the name of Allah, Allah couldn't do? Why is this? Theologically, this is a devastating question to, to Allah and to a Muslim. Because is Allah is the most supreme name then how come in action Jesus' name surpasses in supremacy the name of Allah? And I thought to myself, I should not ask this question because I may become an infidel or become crazy and end up in a crazy house. So didn't want to go to hell, didn't want to go to crazy house. And I thought, I'll forget this. And so... I slept, got up in the morning, and the very first thing that uh, I would say always, as a Muslim, getting up is, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah who is merciful and gracious. But this morning, before I could say in the name of Allah, I heard someone in my head this time saying, then why would Jesus help you? And I literally jumped. I said, who was that? Then... Next few days was exact same story. Everywhere I went, every time I wanted to bring the name of Allah, I would hear, why would Jesus help you? Then why would Jesus help you? Why would Jesus help you? I would open the Quran, which I re read on a habit, and I would read it. I would read the Quran once every 10 days, cover to cover. So I know that, that most churches have a problem reading a lot of Bible, but I've heard you guys read through the Bible once every 10 days here, right? <laughs> Watch, make sure who is laughing. Those are the ones that are not reading their Bible. <laughs> and then I've noticed as I do that through the years, the ones that duck and laugh, they don't, they haven't read their Bible for a long time, you know? <laughs> So, so anyways, as I would open the Quran to read, believe it or not, the name of Jesus would jump out of the page and it scared me. I would just like, I can't read the Quran. I can't do my prayers. What is wrong with me? What has happened? What's this name of Jesus doing to me? So I prayed for two weeks and fasted. And I asked God to show me the truth. I said, whatever the truth is, show it to me. I will follow you. Show me the way I will follow. And I thought to myself, God is like, God is one, right? And it's like the top of a mountain, the peak. There is only one peak. So it doesn't matter how you climb, you come to the same peak. So I thought maybe he has a different way for me. 
And so I thought, if he shows it to me, I'll choose that way. And I prayed for two weeks, and after two weeks, no answer. And I was a bit disappointed, honestly. I was a bit disappointed with God, you know. It just a tad, but Iranian style, you know. Uh, it's a little bit different, you know. In the West, you guys have lots of, lots of emotions and everything else. We Iranians are very much like Jamaicans. <laughs> we are like the switch, on and off, you know. <laughs> and you don't want it. When it's on, it's beautiful. When it's off, you don't want to see us. <laughs> when we are on, we love you, we die for you, we cook for you and everything else. When you're off, you better run. <laughs> and so I got mad at God. And I said, God, forget you, honestly. You know, like the Italians say, forget you. That's it. I'm out of here. I, my buddies are all enjoying their girlfriends and drinking. And I'm here having always pray and pray and pray. And I'm getting nowhere. And you know what? I'm going to go enjoy my life. And when I die, if there is a God, then they say God knows all things. And he, and he judges justly. Now, he knew my heart. He knew how much I love him. What does it matter what name I call him? Allah, Jesus, this, that. What does it matter? He knows in my heart I love him. And that should be enough. And if that's not enough, he should tell me what name I call him. Then I call him that. But he, knowing my heart, knowing how much I love him, came and confused me with the name of Jesus. And then he doesn't show me a way to follow him. So it's his fault I'm here right now. If you're going to blame somebody, blame him, right? Like Adam is like, why did you eat this? He says, the woman you gave me. You gave me. I went to sleep, got up, I get up, I see this woman, you gave it to me, and she told me to eat, I ate. It's your fault. <laughs> you knew all things. <laughs> Why didn't you give me this woman? <laughs> so I had the same kind of thinking. And I thought, you know what? He can't judge me in the day of just judgment. Because if he does, then that shows that he's not a just God. But lo and behold, that moment changed my life. The moment I made a decision like that, I had in Islam committed the only unforgivable sin. Now, why do I say this? You know, in life, people come to a point and a place that they think, I've done the unforgivable thing. And there is no way of return. When in Islam, the moment you put somebody beside God, equal to God, then you have made that mistake. And when I said, I will decide for myself, you see, a Muslim means submitted to Allah, under Allah. And the moment I said, I will make a decision for my life, I said, I am equal to Allah, to making that decision for myself. So I have done the only unforgivable thing in Islam. And now I can never have a way back. And in that very moment, I felt the whole room filled with the presence of God. Now, it's amazing. If you have ever been in a room uh, with, with doctors, the first thing you do, or professors, the first thing you do, you compare yourself with them in education. Uh, if uh, you go into a room with um, a bunch of chefs, the first thing you do, you compare yourself with them, is your cooking. And when God comes into a room, the first thing you do, you compare yourself to him. And now here he is, all perfect, all holy, all just. And then you find yourself, you fall short. You are anything but holy and anything but just. That happens automatically because he shows up 
and he has nothing to hide. But suddenly, even though I have done many good things in my life, even though I had prayed many prayers and I had done many things that I thought that should please God, I realized that I have mistakes in my life. And mistakes cannot be forgotten and forgiven or overlooked just because. They need a payment. They cry for some sort of justice. And I thought to myself, this God is God, and he's ha he has to kill me in order to keep his just part of himself. And I ran to the corner of the room, and I just held my head in my arms, and I cried, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Knowing that there is absolutely no way that he will forgive me, or he should forgive me. But I wanted forgiveness. I kept crying desperately and hopelessly for forgiveness, but I didn't think it is possible. In those moments, you got to remember, uh, as a Muslim, Allah is forgiving, but he cannot forgive you today. You will have to wait for the day of judgment. That's the only way you will know if you are forgiven. So, but I need forgiveness today. It's not like, you know, when you show up in the court, that's the day you need a lawyer. That's the day you need, uh, you know, you need grace. That's the day you need the judge to forgive you. You don't need it 10 years from now. You don't need it at the end of your life. You need it now. And I felt I needed it then, but I knew that's not possible. In that moment, I felt a touch on my left shoulder. And a voice that said, I forgive you. And this is funny because very simple words. I forgive you. The moment I heard those words, I felt that word penetrated through my body. I grabbed hold of everything in my life that was wrong and instantly it disappeared. I thought, how does that happen? to myself. Who is he that forgives me and I feel forgiven today? I didn't understand that. I knew he is God. I knew he just forgave me. But I didn't understand how he can do this. I knew this is a God that I have never heard anything about. I have read about God, but the God that I read about and studied is not this God. And I thought to myself, who are you? And I said, who are you that forgives me and I feel forgiven today? And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I thought to myself, this must be a very powerful statement. But I have no idea what it means. Because I've never heard these words before. So I said to him, I don't understand. What is your name? And he said, Jesus Christ. And the moment he said Jesus Christ, I fell on my face like I have no bone. And I cried for about two hours. You know, some 25 years ago this happened. And that's the story of my conversion. I brought some books. You guys can take it, you know. Ali is, is literally, uh, you know, a brother and a friend. Uh, sometimes you have brothers that are not friends, and sometimes you have friends that are not brothers. But uh, what a beautiful thing when you have a brother that is a friend also, and a friend that is a brother. He is both. So in that aspect, you guys are my family. And we brought some cups, uh, the, for ministry cups that we, we sell normally, and I brought some books that we normally sell, but you guys our family so take and if you wish to donate anything you can do so it would be used for the ministry but uh so i just want you to remember we have only about 24 cups i hope it's it's enough no i think i brought more but anyways i think everyone will get one uh anyways in that moment my life changed i became a christian 
I became a follower of Christ, not because I had a choice, because you lose your choice once you see Jesus in person, right? You run out of all excuses. You don't know, like, I, I don't believe in you because I didn't see you. Or, no, I saw him. So I'm a Christian by no choice, really, you know? <laughs> but, you know, one thing I missed about that moment is the heart of why he forgave me. I forgot, and I never really got it till about uh, some four years ago when Ali said I was going through the things that I was going through. He, he called it a season. And I, I, I'm grateful for his grace. But about four years ago, uh, as I spent time um, building a ministry and everything else, I noticed the ministry is booming, but I wasn't happy with my wife. We were having difficulties. And I'm a person that I, I, I don't like hiding things. I'm black or white, whatever I am, I am what I am, and I don't mind being that, you know? And so I just uh, went and told everybody, I think uh, we're going to end up divorcing. So we went to counselings and everything else. And after three times of seeing a counsellor, the best in the city apparently, he told us to go and get a divorce and not waste our time or money. So uh, that was, uh, you know, really efficient in three times. There we go. But I fell into a depression. And in the depression, I didn't know where I am or what I want to do. I felt like I have lost everything. In the midst of depression, when I, nothing looked good to me, somebody in our church, a young lady came and asked, but Afshin, months ago you had asked something, you had shared something with us. Did you finish that thought? And I was like, I don't remember what the question was, but I felt honored by her. I thought, huh, there is somebody that honors me, where my own wife has no honor for me. And for the first time, I saw her in a different sight, in a different way. When she went around the corner, I noticed something about her I had never, ever noticed before. You know what that was? She had nice legs. I was like, damn, she got nice legs. And then during the next few days, I noticed not only she got the legs, this girl has got the right attitude. She's got a worship spirit. She's got this, she got that, she got everything. And all those things, somehow I couldn't see my own wife. So I went to the pastor that uh, had handed over all the power to, and I said to him, he's a Caucasian guy, and you know Caucasians, and we speak the same language, English, but you know culture is just so different. And so he asked me, he says, Afshin, how are you? I said, I'm good. I think I'm in love with that girl. And he went, <gasps> what? <laughs> I said, yeah, he said, what are you going to do? I said, what do you mean, what am I going to do? He's like, are you divorcing your wife to marry her? I said, no, 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 I'm divorcing my wife, but I don't think I'll ever marry. The type of marriage I've had, I don't think for the next seven generations, any of my children is going to get married. <laughs> and he's like, how can you, your children never get married, but have a generation after? I said, it's a Persian saying, don't worry about it, you know? <laughs> So anyways, I went up to the young lady and I told her, I said to her, I think I'm in love with you. And she turned around to my surprise and said, I've been in love with you for a long time. And that made me really mad at God. I said, you're sitting up there and having fun, huh? You give me a wife. She's a wonderful woman. I mean, you can move Mount Everest, but you can't move Melissa. She's like that. The Chinese are like that. I mean, they just sit there and they, they, they don't move. You know, they just know what they know and you can't move a Chinese really easily. That's who they are. But 
The, another part of the characteristic of the Chinese and being a mountain is they don't have much emotions that they show, you know. They're just there. <laughs> you know, when I got married, I, I thought, oh, you know, I'm Persians. We men kiss each other, we hug each other all the time. I went to hug my wife and she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> what do you mean, what am I doing? I was going to hug you. But we're Chinese, we don't hug. I said, what do you mean you're Chinese, you don't hug? But we're Chinese, we don't hug. I said, well, we are Persians and we hug all the time. <laughs> if that's a good excuse for you, I got it. <laughs> 7,000 years of culture, we got 7,000 years, you know. I said, I wanted to kiss her. She said, we're Chinese, we don't kiss. I'm like, what? How come they didn't tell me this before marriage, you know? <laughs> One of the major reasons I got married is for kissing and hugging, you know? <laughs> it was good that she was a Christian too. <laughs> Honestly. I mean, ministry and all is good too, you know? <laughs> but hey, I felt a bit ripped off, honestly. <laughs> and it's God's fault, I thought. And I blamed him and I got mad at him. And I thought, what am I going to do? What's the best thing I can do? I said, you know what? I don't want my children to think I'm a, I'm a horrible father and left them and everything else. I know what I'm going to do. My wife doesn't like me. I know there's a whole bunch of Christians in the city that don't like me, you know. I'll make all of them happy in one shot. I'll go back to Iran. The Iranian government doesn't like me. They'll kill me. My wife will be happy. My children will be the children of a martyr. And the other Christians here that don't like me will be very happy. The ones that like me will like me even more, you know. <laughs> and the best side of this story is that I don't have to live this miserable life anymore. So I went to Malaysia. And on the way to Malaysia, the Lord spoke to me. And uh, while I was there, the Lord told me that the life that I meant for you is bigger than you. And you have become very self-centered and selfish. And I looked at myself and I realized that it's true. That during the past few months, all I have been thinking is me, 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 me. And I've become so selfish and so self-centered. And I realized, oh my goodness, God had a plan and a purpose for me that was beyond myself. And suddenly, I got out of that prison that I was in, that I had made myself. And when I got out of that, I started to weep and ask God to forgive me. Realized later that part of the day, that not only have I not done what I was supposed to do, I have done things that I wasn't supposed to do. You see, when I told everybody that I'm getting a divorce, I kind of noticed, not only this young lady, but I noticed that there were other young ladies that are starting to say to me, hello, Brother Afshin. And I was like, hello to you too. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the attention. And so, I noticed that all of those was wrong. Lusting after them was wrong. Lusting after their attention was wrong. So, I called my wife and everything, and, and just uh, my wife said, hey, what's going on? I said, yeah, this is what's going on. She said, what do you mean? Yes. I said, yeah, you know, Bible is very clear about adultery. So, even though I haven't physically have sex with anyone, but I have... I have committed adultery, four, uh, four counts of adultery. With that, my wife just hung up on me and I was like, praise the Lord, that's the end of that marriage. I was kind of happy, you know. But the Lord told me, no, this marriage is not over. And I was like, what do you mean it's not over? It's over for me, I'm done. He's like, no, it's not over. I said, Lord, I have given my everything. I've given 100%. He said, 100%? He said, okay, 
He says, then you haven't given all. I said, but I'm not willing to give everything. I'm not giving that half a person unless you give me a reason. And it better not be a verse or a, bi uh, a scripture. Because you may know the Bible, but I know it too. I've been teaching it for a long time. If you give me a verse, I'll give you ten back. And the Lord said to me, I wanted to answer your prayer. I said, she's an answer to my prayer? I said, okay, I'll repent right now. I don't know when I prayed such a prayer that brought such a curse to my life. I pray and I repent right now. And the Lord showed me in a vision that 20 years earlier, when I was in jail, the Lord asked me, ask me one thing, I'll give it to you. And I had asked, I want the opportunity to share the gospel with 1.3 billion Muslims. And he says, okay. And when he said, okay, in the vision I saw, he reached in a big massive land from heaven and out of a huge crowd picked one person, put it aside, it was a female and it was Melissa. And I said, you handpicked her for me. She said, yes. I said, why? He said, because you cannot have that without her. I wanted to answer your prayer. And I realized that for 18 years, I have treated my wife. I have looked at her. I've talked to her. I've thought of her. I've listened to her in a manner that she is not the best person, so she's a mistake. And let's make the best of a mistake. And now, here I realize she was never a mistake. She was a gift to me. And I have treated her as such. And every single time that I looked at her that way or talked to her in that tone, I have sinned against her and against God. And I thought to myself, how do you pay back 18 years of sins against one person? So I turned around, I called her up, and I said to her, I said, I just had this vision. I know I understand that you may never want to have anything to do with me and I can't blame you, I give you the right and I don't have the energy to fight for these things. I just had a vision and in this vision I have just found this, that for the first time in my life I want to live with you. For the first time in my life I want to live with you, but it may be too late. I said the past 18 years has been really difficult for me living with you because I thought you are a mistake. And the next 18 years, you may make it miserable because you want to get me back for the past 18 years, you know? Sometimes women do that, you know? But I said the alternative is for me to go and marry someone younger and more beautiful, and I can do that, but now I know you are the one that God had picked for me, so I would be miserable no matter what. And if I'm supposed to live a miserable life, I'd rather be miserable with you, honey. I thought that was the most romantic thing I could think of, you know. Oddly enough, to a Chinese, that's good enough. <laughs> Only a mountain will say, okay. <laughs> and something broke for us. She said, why do you think I'm a mistake? I said, because our marriage is a photocopy of my parents' wedding and marriage. Since you think they're a mistake, I said, yes. So that makes all you kids mistake. I said, yes. Says you think you guys are a mistake. Uh, yeah. Why do you think such a And I thought, why do I think that? <gasps> My mom always said I made a mistake marrying your dad. And I made a mistake having kids. And she said, oh, that's true. I have always heard your mom saying, I had better hostagars. I had better people asking for my hand but I don't know why I married your dad. So many others had asked for my hand. And I realized, oh my goodness, this is a curse that is widely spread amongst my nation. That no marriage is sanctified and predestined by God. That somehow you got married and okay, it's a mistake. It wasn't the best choice I made, but hey, let's do the best we can with it. And so we began on this journey of reconciling ourselves to the true 
design of what God had intended for our marriage. Some four years later now, our marriage has become very transparent. I'm not saying it has become perfect. No, there are days that we, we get up, both of us, and think, why are we still in this marriage? And we come up with the same answer. Because before, sometimes you would ask that question and we had no answer to that question. Now we do. Now we get up and say, why are we here? Why are we in this marriage? And say, because God in his design chose you to be my perfect match. Even though it doesn't feel that way today. Even though we are not going through a good season. Even though I feel like I can't communicate my heart. But you are the one that God has chosen for me to make me Christ-like. So in my reaction, I desire not any longer do I desire to be Christ-like in, oh, let me preach like Christ, but I want in those moments that I am tested and put and tried to react like Christ did when he was tried and tested by people and trials and situations. And that is what Christian is. So that when we come to, to be a Christian, we come to a church to celebrate and to do this thing, we don't realize that God has brought us to a place that people will test us and try us in many different ways. And we are given the greatest opportunity of our life to act like Christ, to react like Christ would have, should they have treated Christ like that. That's what Christianity is. Many times we are confused and we think, hey, you know, I, I became a Christian because I didn't want to end up in hell. No, if you believe that Jesus came down and died for you and you confess that, that's enough for you to get saved. That's according to the word of God. But to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, to be a little Christ, that's the word Christian meant. To be a little Christ means that people have to test you and try you and act toward you exact same way as they did toward Christ. And now you have been given an opportunity in which you can react like Christ did 2,000 years ago. That's what Christianity is. Open with me to chapter 6 of Matthew, verse 9. Now, we, I've taught on this many, many times, but I don't have a habit of teaching a sermon that I haven't worked on at least a year. So, oh my goodness, this is gorgeous. From much to that. Love. Oh, I love you. She wrote, I love you. Love, Dad. Oh, my goodness. This is gorgeous. <laughs> Satan wanted to rob me from all these things. Today is getting kicks in his face. <laughs> so, verse 9. In this manner, therefore pray. In this manner, therefore pray. You know, many times we don't realize that when Jesus spoke, he was speaking the same language as people understood, but he had a different understanding behind those words. First and foremost, he starts with a word that in English we came to this. In this manner, meaning this is different than the manner you have been praying from. So there is a transformation, there is a change that has come about. Yes. That's right. So you used to pray a certain way, you used to go to the temple, you used to pray a certain way. But now I am asking you to change that 
to shift yourself, to check your perspective in your mind, in your eyes, in your heart, in your strength, in every which way, realign yourself so that you can pray a different way than you have already done before. So there is a different shift of a manner. A mannerism is changing. But the word pray, we have heard that so many times. Daniel prayed. Nehemiah prayed. David prayed. What is this prayer that you are talking to me about, Jesus? And Jesus says, look, I want to give you a picture of what prayer is. I want to give you an original picture of what, what that prayer was meant to be in the mind of God before he ever created the heavens and earth. He says, give us that picture. He says, okay, I want to say to you, when John writes, he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, that with is in a relationship with God. What kind of a relationship did the word and God have? He says, let me tell you this. When the Greeks would come, they would greet uh, each other. They would roll their sleeves up. And then they would greet each other, holding, actually, each other's forearms. Because they wanted to tell each other that I am not bearing any weapons. So they rolled the sleeve up to show that they have no knives. I have not come for warfare. And they would hold each other from arm's length. Now, imagine the skin, the amount of skin that is covered in that touch. The friendship. It was no longer a handshake, but it was a deep relationship. We're going to be linked together arm length. And they said, look, there is a relationship that took place and God, when he created Adam, he wanted to invite Adam into that relationship which I, the only begotten son, had enjoyed with my father in heaven from the very beginning or even before the beginning of time. God was extending his hand and saying, Hey, Adam, I want to extend my arm to you and I want to welcome you into this relationship with my only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit. So would you link arm with me today? Now, when Jesus is saying, In this manner, reach your arms. In this manner, pray, reach your arm and grab hold of God. Because I have come down, Jesus says, so that the desire of my Father that has been in his heart, in his spirit for so long, would finally come to pass. I have come to reach across and say, would you reach across and see the kingdom of heaven is so close. It's so close that you can reach and grab hold of it. The kingdom of God is at hand. So he's saying, come on, in this manner, pray. In this manner, pray. And then he starts. So first, before he even gives us the prayer, before he does anything, Jesus kind of comes and shifts us so that we know who we're reaching over to cross hands with. He wants us to change our mindset. He wants us to change our heart. He wants us to change our mannerism and thinking and looking and hearing. Because if we look at this God in the same old manners that we did, we cannot continue in this friendship, in this re desired relationship that was in the heart of the Father. So he says, would you shift yourself in order to behold what is about to be poured into your cup? And he says this, this is the desire of the kingdom of heaven. This was the very reason Jesus Christ came down to earth. In this one single word, 
all that God desired, the Father desired, the Holy Spirit wanted to bring and pour into us, all that Jesus was going to restore to us was going to be established in this one single word. Our. Our. We read through this so quickly. Our Father who are in heaven. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go so fast. Don't you go so fast because it is a choice word that Jesus uses. Our. Meaning, it's not mine, it's not yours, it's ours. We are equally partners, we are equally shareholders. Shareholders in what? A father. Wait a minute, if we are equally a shareholder in a father, what does that mean? It means you're my sister, you're my brother, you're my brother, you're my sister, and we are each other's brothers and sisters. What? Yeah. It's very simple, but it's very deep. There is a drop that there is, there lays in it an ocean. Ocean of salvation, ocean of healing, ocean of support. Every which thing that you have ever come across, every which need you have ever come across is written in this word, our Father. Meaning, way right before I can even call on Him, I have to realign myself with you, with you. Now we come to cross each other and keep telling each other, brother, sister, brother, sister. And we keep saying that to each other. And that's the first word that comes to our mouth. But that's the last action out of our heart. Because the first action out of our life is we look at each other as competition, as someone that has hurt us, as someone that has gossip behind us, as someone that we don't like. But the first reaction in our heart got to be this. I see my brother. I got to see my sister whom I love dearly. I got to align myself with each other so that I can have a family. Only then can we cry out to heaven and say, Our Father, how dare did I ever think that I can pray that prayer for 24 years and say, Our oh, Father, but I held grudge against my brothers and sisters. And I would say, Our oh, Father, when I had nobody beside me in my heart, I had no one beside me, no one that I felt I love, really, I'm willing to die for. And that needs to happen first. That's right. That's right. My son Kurosh, about two and a half years ago, was playing in a balcony and suddenly he stops. And I'm thinking, Lord, what are we doing here? What is this church? What is it? The ministry? What is it? What, is, what do we have to do in this city and around the world? And suddenly my son comes and says, Dad, you know when we meet people? I said, okay. He said, when we meet people, if we become a family with these people no matter who they are i guarantee you that one day this family will become a church and i thought oh that's true that's very clever he says but dad you know if we meet people and we become a church it's no guarantee that that church has become a family let me repeat that one more time that if we meet people and we become a family, one day guaranteed that family will become a church. But not every time we meet people and we become a church, that church necessarily becomes a family. And he said to me, Dad, you know, people will always leave a church, but they will never leave their family. So when they asked me, what is the title of this sermon? I said, this is not really a sermon. I want to share my brokenness. I want to share that, brothers, sisters, we need to cry out loud and say, our Father. But before we can do that, 
before we realign ourselves and we can reach across and reach and grab hold of the God's arm, the mighty and the strong arm of the Lord, before we can do that, we got to reach across the seats That's right. and look across one another and treat each other like a brother and a sister. That's right. We need to become a family. We need to become such a tight-knit family that if they, they prove to us that Jesus Christ is a bunch of lies and God doesn't exist, that Holy Spirit is not existent, that Bible is all lies, we would still want to come here every Sunday and every other Tuesday and every other day because we have become a family. We have been together too much. We have loved one another too much. We have walked with one another way too much to let go. And when we do that, we become a one heart, one accord. Then we will see the mighty and a strong arm of the Lord reach across from heaven and open up its heaven and pour into our churches, our family, the great and mighty blessing and inheritance that he has meant for us to have. That's what his desire is. Why did the day of Pentecost happen? Because Peter and John, whom they were on two different boats on the first day that Matthew records, he says they were in two different boats, two different families, two different businessmen, two different fishermen, each other's competition. And takes the time through all the four Gospels to reveal to everybody how much of a competition existed between John and James, the brothers of Zebedee, and Peter and Andrew. So much so that James and John say, Mom, would you come and put in a good word for us? Said so that we would be on the right and left hand side of Jesus. They are looking for any chance to bypass Peter. Because John knows, hey, this guy is, if I have one competition amongst the 12, amongst the 70, amongst the 120, this is Peter. And I gotta bypass this guy. I gotta get rid of this guy. He's the main competition. And now, when Jesus has been arrested, is the perfect opportunity for him to do so. He has just denied Jesus three times. He has just publicly in front of everybody said, I don't care about Jesus. That's what he said. Not that I don't know him, but I don't care about him. That I have no close relationship with him that meant anything. In the last time, he says, he said something to this manner if today we were going to put it. I don't give a damn what happens to him. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. He says it. And now John has got the opportunity to bypass it. But watch this. When they prove to him all oh, that Jesus is not Christ because they crucified him. And that was the understanding theologically for all the people lived there that Christ cannot be crucified, Christ cannot die. That's why Peter wants to stop him. Now they have proven that he is not Christ. But look, the disciples no longer having a Christ still get together in the same place. No longer because he was Christ. But because they had been together for too long to let go. Watch what happened. When Mary comes and says, Brothers, Jesus has risen. John and Peter, the disciples, run. John gets there faster, but no longer does he look for an opportunity to go to the grave and be the first one to see the resurrection. But he stands at the door and says, Let my brother Peter go first. Let my brother Peter go first. Because no longer competition is important to John. John has realized, I have learned one thing from Jesus, and that's loving one another. 
He says, Peter, I know how much you long for Jesus. I know it maybe means more to you to see Jesus first. And let him go first. Then Peter, having seen Jesus resurrected, Peter says, you know what? I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. After you see Jesus resurrected, you know what John says? I'm going with you. He's going the wrong way. John says, I don't care if you're going the wrong way. I'd rather be with you. You're way too important for me. Peter, I'm not going to get into my own boat. I'm going to get into the same boat with you. No more competition. When they are in the boat and they hear the Lord, John turns to Peter and says, I think that's the Lord. And allows him to jump into the water first and go and meet Christ at the, the beach. First. Gives him a time to have a one-on-one -on -one audience with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That when these seven said, okay, we want to be in the same boat together. That Jesus forgot about the 130 and met the seven. The seven that were willing to be together. And not let go of a brother. Not let go of a brother. This is what the desire of the Lord is. This is what glorifies God. This is the moment that Jesus takes in front of the other six and says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And restores him. And all the other six brothers are enjoying this moment of seeing the brother being restored to the fullness of his calling that God had intended for him way before the foundation of the earth. And they celebrate that. They welcome that. Now that's the kingdom of heaven on hand. That's the kingdom in hand. When we celebrate each other's calling and fullness of the God's calling in each other's life and we say, I celebrate you even though you may be lifted up higher than I have been. Even though you look less deserving. I celebrate. Amen. Amen. I celebrate my brother's victory. Yes. Because this is a true family. And in this manner, our Father who is in heaven can for the first time be glorified. Amen. This way he can be glorified. Because we cannot think, if I fight with my brother and cuss each other and have competition with one another and always gossip behind one another and judge one another and stab each other in the back or in the chest and think, oh, our Father, be glorified. And many times we do that in the name of gospel. I have carved a knife and I'm carrying it and it's my knife. And the first time you give me an opportunity in the name of gospel, I put my knife in the name of gospel in your back. I think I'm doing God's business. We become like Peter, drawing our own sword, cutting somebody else's ear because we itch to cut them up. But we do it in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, put that sword away. That's right. That's right. You want to do something for me? Do this that I have asked you. Love one another. Love one another. I assure you, my brothers, my sisters, this is going to set our city on fire. This is going to set this place on fire. When people will come, they will see a family that has longed for them, has wanted them, has desired them, and has honor for them, and has so, such a great passion and desire to see them placed in the calling that God had for them. This will set this place on fire. Now, I have been praying, and I, as I felt this, you think you came here because of a church plant. Some of you come here even 
because of rejection of other places. But I tell you, all of that was designed. Yes. All of that was designed. You think God didn't know that? Didn't know how you're going to end up here? But he took you through different pains and sufferings and different moments and ups and downs and brought you a bunch of war warriors that are in the desert to become David's soldiers and army men and mighty men and women of God who sets a place on fire. Who choose to die for one another. This is why you got been put here together. Not because you were rejected or you didn't feel at home somewhere else, but because God wanted you to not feel at home those places so you come here and create a family. A bunch of misfit that perfectly match one another and fit each other. You may have been a misfit somewhere else, but here in this house, you are the missing piece of the puzzle. Because this is the puzzle that God wanted. And for this, I want to say this, the Lord blesses you and has brought you here for a plan and a purpose. And I open the gates of heaven over you right now in the name of Jesus. And I say, great things are about to come down upon you. Great things are you about to encounter. Great things, great, great things. Beyond your imagination has the Lord planned for you and your family in this church. And in just a short season, you will see as you walk in this path of becoming a family and the hearts, I see the hearts melting into one another and suddenly your hearts started to join each other and they became one great big giant heart. And that heart now could pump blood to a greater body. And suddenly, you had the capacity to provide life to many more. And suddenly, I see your numbers increasing. Your numbers increasing. But it says, the Lord says, the Spirit of the Lord says, first, I am giving you an opportunity in this season. I see the next three to six months being a uh, a strategic time for you to melt into one another and become a, a family of covenant, a faithful family that makes a covenant to one another. Not only because of the gospel, not only because of Jesus, not only because of the Father, Holy Spirit, but also because you have been so much, you have spent so much time with one another that you honestly have your own desire for them. That you have become a family both in the physical and the spiritual realm. And in next six months, once this has taken place, I see the Lord has shifted you. And people will come and suddenly, suddenly, they will find themselves to be the, another piece of this puzzle. And the Lord is going to increase your numbers dramatically after that. Dramatically. I've seen many come and visit and go, but after this, I see people come and sit. And suddenly, more and more pieces of puzzle. And I see that actually this puzzle has got 1,000 pieces. Now, this is a strange, but... I feel as if this church has the potential of becoming at least 1,000 members strong. But the Lord says, would you become the heart first? I will bring the people. I will bring them across your path in your workplace, on the streets, in your neighborhood, your relatives. Some of your relatives that are not here are going to end up here. Some of your family members, some of your friends that are actually parts of other churches, but they belong here. They will come later. Next to three to six months is very strategic. Spend time with one another. Love one another. 
Pray for one another, one another daily. Intercede. And do physical, practical things to join your hearts to one another. Let the other one be first. And be willing to walk with them, even if they are walking the wrong way. Get into that boat with them with love and protection. And cry that the Lord Jesus will meet them in their boat, wherever they are. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.